Hi, I'm Peggy Lures, and this is the Feminist Media Review brought to you live at 525 on the second Monday of each month on Channel 17. Um, this is a live call-in show and the phone number is 862-3966. I'm going to talk today mostly about the whole um, hashtag Me Too, all of the men in power who are sort of finally getting outed as to what's been going on for years and years and years and not just in Hollywood but everywhere and it's interesting to look at a whole lot of things um, let's see for one so I am someone who grew up in the 50s and the 60s I graduated high school in 1963 when I was in high school there was a very very strong double standard um, there still is, but we had some illusions that that, 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 that went away a bit. But um, when I was in high school, um, any girls who were suspected of being sexual were pretty severely punished and looked at pretty poorly. And um, I learned a lot because I used to hang out with a couple of boys. And those boys would talk about the girls, and they would talk about the girls they wanted and usually couldn't get. And what I did notice very quickly was if they did get somewhere uh, with, these, with the girls they desired, they quickly turned into horrible tramps. So this was a pretty good lesson to me, what to do around men and <laughs> what, what they would be like. Um, I hang out with those guys because I would sneak out and go 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 out in a car with them, and then we would just hang out not too far from my my house. But it was it was a real education to hang out with these two guys, who were my age, um, but were not you know were not guys that I was dating, with guys that I knew, and um, I got to hear a lot of what they thought about women, and that was a good education for me. Um, wasn't enough, but. Um, so then we supposedly had sort of a sexual revolution in the 60s with the hippies and, you know, sex became less, uh, more open, somewhat freer, but really pretty much on, on male terms. Um, it w still, it was an improvement for women over the 50s where, you know, you just weren't supposed to be sexual at all. So at least it was like, it was kind of okay for women to be sexual, but then it was like, women were supposed to be sexual for everyone and that whatever, you know, whenever men wanted it. And um, then it became more of a, like, you must be sexual. Um, so, you know, it rarely has been on women's terms. The, the one movement that ever really tried to look at sexuality from the point of view of females was the lesbian separatist and the lesbian feminist. And of course, those are the most reviled people uh, in the political sphere these days. Um, because, <laughs> because that's not something patriarchy and a lot of men want to put up with. Um, but that was the only group that ever said, you know, what would a sexuality that was female-centered instead of phallically-centered be like? And how would that be different? And how might that be a better thing? But we kind of lost that battle. We lost that battle a lot because pornography really took over. And that's a case of where the, you know, pornography was always there. But the internet has really made it tremendously more intense and more available so that your average 11-year-old boy is getting his sex education from the internet and from pornography on the internet. And pornography, I think a lot of people think it's like, you know, naked women and, and pictures of sex, which isn't, is, it's a lot worse than that. Most pornography now, and the pornography most sought after is what's called gonzo pornography. And it's very much about being abusive to women. And even the pornographers have gotten to the point where they don't know what to do next because they've done all kinds of, of really nasty stuff to women, torture, hanging them. Uh, we even had snuff videos where women were killed on video. And they're hard, finding it hard to find out find more to do um, to keep keep up this what is really an addiction I, I always like what Susan Griffin said she said you know erotic desire is something that can be satiated but pornography is more like addiction you need it always has to be more and weirder 
and more intense to you know to keep the audience. So uh, so pornography is everywhere, and uh, I I'm hoping that we'll get to show a little bit of Gail Dines if we can deal with the technical uh, parts of it. Um, because she, there's no one who does a better job than talking about it, and I, I would highly recommend that you go to YouTube and look at any of the videos that Dr. Gail Dines, that's Gail, G-A-I-L, Dines, D-I-N-E-S, uh, and what she has to say. So what we've got now is really the grossest kind of pornography. Um, you know, wanting to understand about sexuality is a fairly normal thing, but that is not what pornography is. The pornography that is going on is really vile, and woman-hating and has been for a long time. And as people like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon have pointed out, pornography isn't, um, pornography hurts women. Not only because of, of the message it puts out of, of being so, you know, abusive to women, but because actual women involved in it um, have, um, you know, have a very unpleasant jobs for the most part and they are not listened to and they are abused in that. So that's that's one part of what's going on. I think that's a part that has made our that has helped to make our entire culture uh, less uh, empathetic. Um, it has certainly done a real number on uh, male sexuality with young women reporting that you know uh, to therapists that you know, that they're expected to do the kinds of things that their boyfriends see in porn and they're not that into it. But the men expect it. There was one woman, I think I might have told this story already on this, who uh, she made a film about women's breasts because she knew a young couple who were engaged and uh, the man, man confided in her and said, I really love her and everything, but she, had, she doesn't have very great breasts. And this woman thought, her breasts are fine. They're just, you know, and she realized that so many men didn't even know what breasts look like except for pornography where they tend to be airbrushed or um, pumped up or silicon. So she made a film just about, just of breasts to, to you know, sort of try to bring back the idea. But it, porn has really taken over and, and it's resulted in things like women um, having labial surgery to be smaller and tighter and in, and in everybody feeling that they have to be waxed and not have hair and it's it's you know it's it's really a pretty gross thing but that's one thing and that kind of sets up everybody uh, to be more accepting of some of the worst stuff but what has been coming out is um, the way men in power use it to abuse women, to rape women, to abuse them, to sexually assault them. And it's, um, you know, Harvey Weinstein is the, is the name that we've heard most often. Yeah. We've also heard of Kevin Spacey. And it's interesting that and one of the, the interesting thing to me about the Kevin Spacey case is that when a young man said this about Kevin Spacey, he was immediately believed. It takes, seems to take 30 or 40 women uh, to accuse a man before they are believed. Um, but it, it's not just Hollywood. This goes on everywhere um, and, and has for a long time. And it's not new in Hollywood. Uh, some people have posted on Facebook. Um, uh, one of the things that has come out is uh, Maureen O'Hara back in the 40s, 1945, talked about um, her unwillingness to give in to the casting couch and the uh, sexual requirements of some of the directors and producers in the movies that she wanted to be in, and she lost some roles because of it. But she wasn't having it, and she spoke out about it, but it didn't make any difference. Um, we certainly had Anita Hill back in the 80s um, who unfortunately had to deal with an entire panel of all men when she uh, discussed who, who Clarence Thomas was and what he had done to her and sexually harassing her and you know she wasn't really believed by that group of you know all these great colleagues from the Senate they're so collegial they just love each other um, you know, they're supposedly on opposite sides sometimes, but really they're a boys club and they certainly acted like a boys club around the Nita Hill. So Clarence Thomas has been on the court uh, to the detriment of the court and to the de detriment of our judiciary. Um, 
I would say, and, and uh, our, none of that is getting any better. Now we have a sexual, a self-confessed sexual assaulter as the president. And it kind of goes with him hanging out as he did this week with a Duterte in the Philippines. And he just loves Duterte, who has been shooting his own people. And that is how he's just dealt with the drug problem, by having a, a, a death squad go around and shoot these people on the street. Uh, we often in this country talk about, you know, we don't tolerate with pe people who's sh who kill their own people. But um, we've got Donald Trump having a bromance with Duterte, uh, singing songs to each other, just loving each other up in their uh, alpha male, <laughs> supposed alpha male. Um, what? I don't even know what to call it in their alpha male uh, domination fantasy delusions. So, and it goes, these all go together, as does the whole instance of the other thing that's been in the news has been tremendous, um, horrible shootings in Las Vegas, over 50 people killed, over 500 people injured, and then a bunch of people, 22 people killed in a church during church service. Uh, and we always know when they say the shooter and they don't say Muslim or black, we always know it's a white male because they don't say. When they don't say, you know it's a white male because you know if it was a Muslim, you know if it was a black man, you know it, it's just about never a woman. Um, so you know when they don't say um, that it's a white man because we don't want to talk about how, how messed up white men are and white men are really, really messed up. They are the ones that carry out all these uh, uh, massacres. They are, it is, it is almost always them. And, um, and in the cases of sexual assault, well, it, 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 that crosses the color lines a bit more, but there's a hell of a lot of white men out there doing this. I mean, there was Bill Cosby. And it's, it's interesting that uh, the persona of these assaulters, you know, well, in the persona of Bill Cosby, he was like Mr. Dad, you know, Mr. The Really Good Dad. I, I always found uh, Bill Cosby rather obnoxious because of his, his uh, watching him on TV, he was, he was always uh, pushing the idea that, that there was nothing wrong with capital. Uh, punishment. I mean, there's nothing wrong with physical punishment for children, which I don't really think is a good idea. But uh, you know, he was always uh, seen as you know Mr. Dad, and uh, then we find out that he had been sexually assaulting, using drugs, at least 40 women over the years, um, and he hasn't gotten near the uh, just desserts, uh, not Jello or pudding. Um, but he hasn't gotten his just desserts really on that. So now we've got Harvey Weinstein, we've got Kevin Spacey, and we've got uh, Louis C.K. who, uh, who uh, yeah. you know, sort of tried to present himself as a feminist, but, um, but uh, seemed to really have a problem, particularly with lesbian comedians that he wanted to uh, exert his power over because that is what this is about with these men in power it is not it is, it is it's it's about sex sort of but it's about asserting you know who they are I'm so powerful I can you know I can make you or break you or give you a role or not give you a role or uh, I can be Louis CK and talk about how groovy I am with women and then I, I bring two women up to a room then he brings two women up to a room and whips off his clothes. Um, I don't know what it is about men that makes them think that um, whipping out their dick is going to just thrill women. Um, you know, I'm a lesbian, so I'm not very interested in sex with men at all, but a lot of women are. It's not that they don't want to have sex with men, but I don't think there's very many women who ever um, thought that um, having a man they didn't even know whip out his dick was a really thrilling or exciting uh, and interesting come on. I don't think that happens. 
In fact, I was in college and I, in the University of Tampa, and my very first date there, I was just walking around the campus, and the next thing I know, I'm standing next to a guy with his stick out. And my reaction to that was, ah, get the hell away from me. And I never had anything to do with that. I got away from him, and I never had anything to do with that guy. And I just couldn't believe it. Once when I worked in the uh, uh, RU12, I had to take over for one of the men um, who, who uh, was doing the work downstairs. And, and some of the work that was done in RU12 was men would go on cruising sites so that they, the men who worked there would go on cruising sites so that they could uh, talk up safe sex and talk up condoms and talk up AIDS prevention, which was a perfectly good thing to do. But that meant they were going on all these men looking for men sites, and I can't remember the name of them. But um, so one day I came downstairs and I and I and I had to uh, take over from this guy. And then once I took off the screen thing, there was there was the uh, interface for uh, whatever it was, manhole or whatever, <laughs> whatever. Whatever they called their um, their dating site, but there was a guy uh, with his dick out, and that was his advertisement for his film. And I just laughed because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, I didn't get the dick pic in the in the mail, which in my email, which I wouldn't have liked. But you know, it just made me laugh because I just thought that it was just so funny because I could not imagine in in a million years that a woman would ever advertise on a dating site by taking a picture of her vagina. This would never happen. Um, this would never happen. So, uh, you know, just that, that that's not, you know, that's, that's, an, uh, that's an abusive power kind of thing when a Harvey wants to. So I, I would like you to listen to uh, this is a little bit further away when we, I guess we'll have a chance to come back. And um, I want to go to Gail Dines and have her talk a little bit about pornography and, ha and the state that it is at this point in time, um, where we are with this. Because I think a lot of people still think pornography is playboy and just, you know, naked women and stuff. But it, it's, it's pretty vile. And uh, it's a thing. This culture so. is socializing our young girls to be ready for pornography, whether they ever end up on a porn site or not. And the reason for that is they are being taught to hypersexualize and pornify themselves. And really, when you think of all the thousands of images, they all come down to a young, white, blonde, toned female. Now, we do let some women of color in, if they look like Beyonce, or of course Rihanna. We have a concept called the reader inscribed in the text. Look at this woman. Look at her clothes, look at her face, look at her posture, and look at her gaze, G-A-Z-E. Who is she speaking to? Because the notion is that every image has a reader in mind. Before you answer, do you think she's speaking to her mother, saying, let's go for a cup of coffee after the photo shoot? <laughs> so who's she talking to? men and what's she saying fuck me would you all agree <laughs> so this is what i call the fuck me lot now i want you to think what it means to be male and grow up in a culture where before you can even speak females are offering themselves to you come get me come get me now what happens to young girls is when they are developing their sexual identity what they learn is they have two choices either fuckability or invisibility. And what do you want from a teenager when built into the DNA of adolescence is the need to be visible? What do you want from her when her friends are walking around with low slung jeans, a tramp stamp, with the midriff showing? What do you want her to do? Because it is impossible to ask her to go for invisibility. So this is not a choice. This is being forced into a type of sexuality that she didn't invent, that she didn't decide because there are so few choices. You know who really told me what it was? It was actually incarcerated child rapist. I like to call Dick. Now, Dick was in prison for raping his 12-year-old stepdaughter. And he was explaining to me how he groomed her. 
And then he looked me straight in the eye and he said, the culture did a lot of the grooming for me. The culture is mass perpetrating against our girls. Perp culture part two for the boys is the porn industry. There is an entire generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. Now for the uninitiated out there, a money shot is ejaculation on the face. A student told me that she was talking to a boyfriend and he said to her he had a deal breaker, that she had to let him come on a face. And she said, no, I'm not letting you do that. So get rid of the notion of playboy, penthouse, or even hustler. Those were the good old days of pornography. What changed everything was the internet. The internet made pornography affordable, it made it accessible, and it made it anonymous. Do you know that porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined? Just get your head around that. And that we know that from studies that nearly 90% of the top watched rented scenes have at least physical or verbal abuse against the woman. I'm going to follow the breadcrumbs of a 12 year old with no credit card, put porn into Google and I'm going to tell you what he's going to see. The first thing he's going to see, the major act on virtually all websites is gagging. This is where the man puts the penis so far down her throat that she gags almost to the point of vomiting. They put a lot of mascara on her face so that she's actually tearing and you can see the rivulets of mascara running down. As she is choking, he grabs her head and he pulls her towards him and he says, look at me, and she is choking. This is a kind of sexual psychopath. And when you think that porn is the major form of sex ed, think what's gonna happen to the next generation of boys, most of whom are brought up on hardcore mainstream internet porn. Now, the average 12 year old, when he goes on to porn, when he puts porn into Google, what do you think he thinks he's going to see? Breasts, people having sex? Do you think he's thinking of gagging? Of course he's not. They're telling him, you want to be a male? This is your entree into masculinity. And in that boy's stomach, is a toxic stew. He feels enormous shame that he is aroused and nobody has said to him, this is not who you are because the pornographers say to him, this is who you are. This is what you want because we take your gorgeous young bitches and we do what every man would really like to do. But you know what? That's not true. And I know that's not true. And I know that's true because feminists are men's best friends, because we believe more in men than the pornographers do. And you know how I know that the pornographers don't tell the truth about men? I know that as a feminist, I know that as a scholar, and above all, I know that as a mother of a son. My son is worth better than this. If my son is, then I believe your son is too. Let me read you the kind of promotional copy from the movie Anally Ripped Whores. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. Chicks being ass-fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for the whores when their work is done. And I want to make this clear, this is mainstream porn. This is what the 12-year-old boy gets to within 15 seconds. We know from 40 years of research that the younger the boys get to porn, the more it limits their capacity for intimacy, the more it decreases their empathy for rape victims, the more it increases depression and anxiety, and the more likely they are to engage in risky sexual behaviour. Now we have a whole generation of boys desensitised, because really what you want at 10 is different to what you want at 15, 20, 30. So where's this going? In 2002, the Free Speech Coalition, which is the lobbying arm of the porn industry, lobbied the Ashcroft Court to take away the argument that you couldn't use girls who looked under 18. And this is what we got overnight. Teen porn. First time with daddy. Daddy's whore. It's okay, she's my stepdaughter. What are we gonna do? How are we going to tie this porn monster down step by step? We're going to use the Gulliver strategy. Education by education by education. We're going to use a public health approach. Just like we stop drinking and driving, you bring to the table 
all those who have a vested interest in the well-being of the next generation. And at my group, Culture Reframed, we are taking the public health model and we are going to build parents' programs, we are going to build programs for professionals, we are going to build programs for students, because we are going to tie this porn monster down piece by piece. And you know why? Because our children are worth more, our culture is worth more, our boys are worth more, and our girls are worth more. Thank you very much. Okay, so... She got into some of the details of what porn is like these days. So this is part of rape culture. Porn is a big part of rape culture. Porn is like the, the propaganda for it. The men in power who consistently abuse women, uh, I guess it was Mark Halperin who, the, the char and he's a, a political commentator and the charge against, you know, one of the women who worked for him just had a job there and the next thing she knows, she's sitting at her desk and he's behind her rubbing his erection against her. Um, women should not have to put up with this garbage. These guys have been getting away with it forever. I hope this is a turning point. It seems like it might be because so many people are coming out and it's getting very hard to deny. And people like Louis C.K. have had to at least admit it, although I don't find his supposed apology very satisfying. In fact, he doesn't really apologize, but he does, he does at least admit it. Unlike people like Roy Moore, because the one, you know, this happens left and right, but there does seem to be a lot more hypocrisy on the right because Roy Moore is a guy who was uh, disbarred because he insisted on, though he was told it was not allowed, when he was on the Supreme Court in Alabama, he insisted on having the, the Ten Commandments there. He insists that, that God's law outdoes uh, man's law. Well, that is not how our system works. We have a separation of church and state. We have probably one of the most religious countries in the world because we don't have a state religion, but we have a lot of Christian, particularly the Dominionists, who would like us to have a state religion. And Roy Moore um, was sexually abusive to young girls and is trying to uh, get away from that and, and has been defended by evangelicals saying, well, you know, Joseph and Mary, uh, Mary was young and and Joseph was much older, so that makes it okay. I mean, and the very, very fact that evangelicals elected Donald Trump, despite his, you know, self-admitted being a sexual abuser. Um, in fact, many, some of them in Alabama are saying uh, the fact that this story has come out against Roy Moore, the some 40 percent of evangelicals say that makes them want to vote for him even more. And that was probably a selling point for certain people, uh, particularly men, but there's some really bizarre women out there these days. There is women who are into raunch culture um, who, you know, thought that made uh, Donald Trump more of a man. I put up a thing this morning on my own Facebook saying, um, have we figured out yet that alpha men are not the solution but the problem? Toxic masculinity is a big problem. Our, all, almost all of the uh, people who have gone on to do mass assassinations and massacres with, with, with uh, um, AR-15s and AK-7s and I don't even know all that. I don't even give a damn about all the you know little uh, names and carbines and numbers that go with the guns. But all of the but what I do care about is almost all of these guys previously had been had some kind of um, record of of domestic domestic violence, of wife battering, of beating women, of abusing women. And that would be a perfectly good key to noticing who who's likely to do this. In fact, in Canada, in Canada to get a gun, your your um, wife has to sign off, your ex-girlfriend has to sign off, uh, or you know, the last woman you dated. So a woman has to testify that uh, it's real, you're, you're someone who would be safe with a gun, which is a pretty good idea. Um, and they don't have near the, the uh, mass killings that we do. Uh, the school shootings, the theater shootings, the mall shootings, the now, you know, ever more spectacular, ever more record-breaking, and we just say, 
fine, that's okay, because in America, guns are so much important than lives, including kids' lives when there's a shooting like at Sandy Hook. So our problem is men in power. Feminists have been saying this for years and years. No one likes to listen to feminists. They're so annoying. They want to overturn the order. Men don't want to hear it. Other women don't. Oh, you know, that we've got a whole kind of uh, very um, not very, very feminist sort of feminist movement that's just so worried about pleasing men and not upsetting them by being anti-porn or anti-prostitution and by taking away the ability for women to even have shelters uh, just for women. So we really need to get back to uh, a feminist movement. We need to, uh, I think that, that, that what's coming out is going to help strengthen that because it, it becomes very, very, very difficult to deny it anymore. So many men. Yeah, not all men, but always men. Um, and there isn't much happening uh, from men to do something about it. We couldn't, when, we, when I was in the Burlington Women's Council, we proposed education going into the schools that would start at the earliest grades and be upgraded every four years ago to teach children how to get along with each other, how not to sexually assault or how to report it, how to do good touch, bad touch, and, and on and on. Because, um, but they wouldn't allow that. There was already, uh, the government had commanded and there was drug education in the school, but they would not allow an education around violence and, and conflict resolution and some of the things that could early, be early interventions to uh, the kind of violence that, that comes up in marriages with wife beaters and, and abusers. And um, as I said, the pornography from the internet has really taken over. There's been... Uh, you know, the idea that this is free speech, but this has been abuse of women, and it abuses women in the making of it. Um, the other issue that feeds into this is prostitution, the idea that you can buy a woman. Uh, young, young men will say, you know, they, they deserved sex because they bought dinner. Um, so that idea has to go. Um, the Nordic model is, is the one good thing there that's happening where, where demand for prostitution is criminalized, not not the people who are victimized by it, but the people who um, the demand side is criminalized. And that is working. Where that has been implemented, it's lessening uh, prostitution. And that needs to happen. And we need a women's movement that, that gets back to the principles of, of respecting women. And we need people like Gail Dines doing what she's doing and looking at, looking at pornography as a public health issue, because it really is. It really is. Uh, twisting the sexuality of people, of men, uh, and boys, young boys who, you know, there's, there's very little capacity for intimacy in someone who has been brought up with that. It's, it's, it is an addiction. It is, it's a perversion of a, of a, of a de decent sexuality, and it, and it, and it uh, really prevents intimacy and in decent relationships um, between people. So it, it only exacerbates um, the tensions between the sexes um, and it has been so horrific for women and has kept them, um, has stopped them from, you know, going further in their careers. It, it you know, and the women are not believed, that's, that's consistent too. And the Bible and the Koran all say that it takes at least two women to equal the word of a man in testimony. When, we, when feminist, um, you know, when women did uh, studies of the courts and how they worked out, it worked out about that way. And you can see from this how many, it takes a ton of women for, for anybody believes that these guys do what they do consistently, regularly, and... Uh, I hope that this is a moment when that begins again, and I hope that it's also a moment when women realize we really need a women's movement. We cannot um, count on our society to do it for us. The only times that we have changed things for the better for women are when we've had a good, strong women's movement.